After the first hour, we were into five-foot seas, and I was starting to get a little uncomfortable. <laughs> After the second hour, we were into 10-foot seas. By the fourth hour, I was 15 miles out into the Pacific Ocean. I was into 15-foot waves. What was I thinking? Imagine that. Do you know what a 15-foot wave looks like? These advancing mountains of water, the height of this wall here, would come rolling toward me, completely block out the view out of my window, send me up in the sky like an elevator. I couldn't even turn my head a fraction of an inch because it would just induce another vomiting episode. And I was Aside from learning that sea sickness will be an issue for me as I cross the Pacific Ocean, I also learned that our design was very, very safe, very stable, and it was very, very efficient. I ended up traveling over 30 miles that day in conditions that were very far from ideal, and this would have been really difficult to do in a kayak or any other kind of human-powered boat. And it got me to thinking that maybe our pedal-powered drive technology that we had developed for the boat could be used in a lighter, faster boat on flatter, calmer water to go after another world record. So I looked into it, and I discovered that there was a human-powered boat distance record. It was 104 miles, and I quickly calculated that our technology used on a faster, lighter boat would be easily capable of going at least 104 miles. So charged with this newest challenge of now conquering the water by human power, I built a very simplified version of within my ocean crossing boat, and I planned my first attempt at the 24-hour human-powered boat distance record attempt, which we set for the 4th of June, 2007, on Glenmore Reservoir, my hometown of Calgary, Alberta. And it ended up being a grueling 24 hours, complete with all the usual fun, like getting sick and crying and yelling and screaming at my crew and <laughs> regretting to spare. Basically your standard run-of-the-mill world record attempt, right? <laughs> Same pain. And same result, I was successful when I crossed the finish line 24 hours after we started with a total distance traveled of 108 miles. Thank you very much. <laughs> Two days later, I got a phone call from California, this fellow named Carter Johnson. Now, I would describe Carter as a helpful person. Carter was trying to help me understand that the human-powered distance for water was not 104 miles, nor was it 108 miles. And he knew that because last summer he had paddled his off-the-shelf kayak a total of 150 miles in 24 hours. So I looked into Carter's claim and I discovered, much to my horror, that Carter was right. You see, the official records committee had Carter's record attempt documentation in the process of ratification, which was why it wasn't yet posted as an official record. Basically, I hadn't done my homework. That is a whopping 40% farther than I went. The 104-mile record that I thought was my goal wasn't even remotely close to the real 24-hour record. Would you like to know how that felt? I'll show you. <laughs> yep, that was me. So I was biting off more than I could chew by thinking that I could be the fastest man on land and the fastest man on water. But this was my vision. And I was not about to allow the discouraging news about Carter's record get in my way of accomplishing what I had really set out to do. But that meant I had to find a way of beating Carter's unfathomable 150-mile kayak record. And this was a seemingly impossible challenge considering that I had missed it by a whopping 42 miles. <laughs> that would have taken me an additional 10 hours to make up. And it was a controversial vision as well. You see, the kayak community didn't take very kindly to this pedal boat guy challenging their hero. And in fact, they thought the whole idea was kind of a bit of a joke because, I mean, how could a pedal boat compete with one of the oldest forms of human transportation on water? They thought it was preposterous. Some of them even thought it was sacrilegious. 
but maybe they were right. I didn't really even know for sure. So back to the drawing board I went. I found the smartest engineer in the boat, human-powered boat design community, and together we came up with a brand new design that we felt would be capable, at least on paper, would be capable of challenging Carter's kayak record. After building Critical Power 2 in my shop, testing revealed that it was a little slower than what we'd hoped for. And in fact, all of the testing that I did uh, resulted in the same disappointing result that I would end up being about six to 10 miles short of Carter's kayak record. And we tried everything we could think of to make critical power two faster, spent the entire summer, it's like four months just working on making her faster. We shaved the total weight of the boat down to a paltry 40 pounds, tested all kinds of very crazy aerodynamic enhancements. We tested various propeller shapes and sizes. I even lost five pounds. The result, in the end, was probably that Critical Power 2 was the fastest pedal-powered boat on the planet. But the verdict, unfortunately, was the same, that I would need to increase my effort level by about 15% to beat Carter's kayak. And that seemed impossible. So what did I do? I went for it, of course. It was going to be the toughest 24-hour record attempt I had ever attempted. And I was going to have to go all out from the start to the finish. There was no other way. This was going to be an ultra marathon at sprint speed. So early on Monday morning on September 8th, and this is still very fresh in my mind because it was only about nine months ago, I climbed aboard Critical Power 2 on Whitefish Lake in Montana in front of a team of officials from the International Human Powered Vehicle Association, my own support crew, friends and family. Talk about biting off more than I could chew. I knew the only way I was gonna get anywhere even remotely close to Carter's kayak record was to never stop pedaling. And that's exactly how I received my support handoffs for the entire 24 hours so that I actually never did stop pedaling. And number two, never ease off on that intensity level and that is exactly what I did. I crossed that start line at an intensity that was unthinkable and I hung on for dear life. Shortly after the start, Helen contacted me by radio and she said, Greg, slow down, you are going out way too fast. You are never gonna be able to hold on to that pace. And I said, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. With a bit less than 20 minutes to spare, I actually surpassed Carter's kayak record. And by the end of the 24 hours, I had my second world record of 152.3 miles, a mere 2.3 miles over Carter's kayak. But I had done it. No person in history had traveled farther in 24 hours on water under their own power than I had. They say that success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. But I don't believe that that's true. In fact, I think it's the other way around. I believe that success is 10% perspiration, 90% inspiration, and that is because it takes a truly inspired idea to create your success. You know what? The perspiration stuff, that happens on its own if you have a solid enough vision of your success. And I feel that the human powered boat record is exactly the kind of perspiration that can result from a bold inspired vision. I wanted to be the fastest man on water and I really felt like my inspiration was propelling me up to this level required to achieve what I felt was impossible for me. And that is what uh, an inspired vision can do for you. Do you have any goals that uh, are so ambitious that they seem almost insurmountable? If you do, first of all, good for you. That's what it means to be bold. But second of all, have a little faith in your inspiration because it will eventually provide you with the perspiration that you require to achieve your impossible dreams.